You didn't come here to talk about that, though, today. You came here to talk about this and hear him talk about what he wants to talk about to you. Who is he? Who is this guy? He's global director for uh, good product management strategy and lifecycle strategy for Google Workspace. He is an advisor at Cal Berkeley's Skydeck Accelerator. He's also an advisor for the University of Michigan's Desai Accelerator and Tech Arb, former student accelerator. Before he did any of that, he was at VMware. VMware is a tremendously big company now with 35,000 employees, but when he started there, they were a five-year-old company without anywhere near that number. In fact, when he started there, they were about $50 million in revenue, and now they're over $5 billion in revenue. When he was there, he was senior director in product marketing and user computing, M&A strategy and implementation, professional services and advanced services, and he got a lot of the training he needed. He told me this morning, he said it all came from his time at Kane. Kane, when he worked there, was where everything uh, was embedded in him. But that's not the only thing he did when he was a student. He was also on the solar car team, as you might see. Not just the solar car team, the first one that raced across the country domestically here in 1990. Pretty awesome stuff. He was also a member of the Michigan crew team, a club team at that point in time. And since that point, he has been nominated for the College of Engineering's Willie Hobbs Moore Award for Outstanding Mentoring. And that is an incredibly accurate description and fit for my friend, my fellow alum, and your uh, hopeful future advisor and mentor. He is an incredible person who's incredibly generous to us, he's been a partner at CFE for at least seven to eight years, and he is one of the nicest people I've ever met. Please give me a hand in welcoming Pete Giordano. <laughs> that it? <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Yeah, okay. I appreciate it. Is this thing is this thing on? You're on? Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. That was super generous. Um, I think some of those things were true that he said. So. Just have to figure out which ones. That's your job. Um, I'm super humbled and honored to be here, seriously. It's <laughs> such a delight to come back as an alum and to see all your faces. I got some time with students yesterday. I did a little class. What was the, what class was that? 427? Oh, yesterday? Yeah. Oh, ELP. ELP. It was an ELP, an Entrepreneurship Leadership Program. Apply if you haven't. Um, it's just so great to be with students. You all are so full of energy and life, and that's one of the reasons I love being here. So thank you for having me. Um, I hope, I think I, I put something together for us to talk about. And um, what I thought was this, this idea of career growth. And, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting that I've, I've learned, um, it's been 30 years since I graduated. I, I know it only looks like 10. As we were supposed to say, yes, you're right. Okay, okay. so I look like that. Uh, but I do, I've done a lot more thinking about my career, especially in the last, like Eric mentioned, seven or eight years, because I've been working so much more with students, and I get a lot of questions, and so I used to start by just answering by just listing off my LinkedIn, like in the timeline view, and then I realized it was a little bit more of a bowl of spaghetti than that very clean and neat linear sort of uh, layout. And it's led to a lot of like topics. And so one of them today is really this idea around career. We thought we'd take a little bit of a break um, from kind of the traditional format. And, and one, one of the other things I've, I've recognized, and I see my, my three kids you know, going through, is this concept of, of education. Now I know I'm here at the University of Michigan, and I'm sorry for any of the, you know, the faculty or administration that's, that's in the audience, but you know, education is mostly about people telling you kind of what you need to know and know how to do, okay? But learning is really about what you do for yourself, right? It's, it's your intentional um, focus. It's what, you, it's what you put in is what you get out, right? And the thing that I'd, I'd like to challenge you all with is, is to think about the fact that, you know, your experience here at University of Michigan is, is a transition period. It's this transition from being a participant in your learning and in your education to being the driver of your learning. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that and really share, I guess, would be a better word, 
some of my experiences and some of the things I think might be important to, to becoming, that, becoming that driver. So yeah, this idea of career, right? Maybe you're thinking about it as, oh, it's going to be the jobs and the roles and the money you're going to make right over the next 30 or 40 years, probably longer given right, where things are going. But I, I, would, I would challenge you to think of it a little bit differently, OK? Think of it in terms of this idea that your career is actually a process that really doesn't ever end. I know that sounds really daunting and horrible and laborious, but it can be very rewarding and fun. And there's this idea about your career being a process by which you hone your zones of genius. And the zone of genius is something that I did not come up with. It actually comes from a book called The Big Leap. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, ideas and philosophies around the same, same sort of thing. Um, but this one I thought rhymed really well, and so that's why it's in the, in the deck. No, just, just kidding about that. I actually do believe this, right? The zone of genius up at the top, I'm going to switch gently here. The zone of genius at the top here, top right, you know, this is a place where I think all of us are always trying to get to. It's where we love what we're doing, and when we're doing it, it feels like super effortless. It's very easy for us to do it, and we're awesome at it, and the way we know we're awesome at it is how. Who's going to tell me, how do you know you're awesome at something? Anybody want to tell me? Yes. People praise you for your work. Okay. Uh, we need, Eric, we, the 20, we need to give it to the student here. Okay. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. It's just a joke. Um, no, it's about, it's about when the people who you are responsible to deliver your work product to, when they are telling you you're awesome, and the people that you collaborate and partner with because you can't get anything done alone in this world anymore, when they tell you you're awesome, that's when you're awesome, okay? And so it's about that third-party objective evidence. And when you've got all those things, and somebody will pay you to do it, <laughs> I think that's really being in what I would call our career zone of genius. I thought about this a little bit, um, and it's like, well, gosh, how do you, how would one actually go, you know, do that? And there's some information in the book, but my, my journey was very, very different. And, you know, it's not something you can hone in on by being a dilettante or taking a trek in the Andes or going on a meditation retreat or doing a walkabout in the desert, right? The, the, the idea of, of honing in on this zone of genius comes from a very intense and intentional process of kind of a, a, an awakening sort of thing where you're actually thinking about, in a meta way, what are you doing? How is it playing out? What are the results of it? What do other, how am I showing up with others in the context of collaborating on a, on a work product? And there's lots more to this. Um, just FYI, I just have to call this out. All of these images I made myself using stable diffusion. If you aren't practicing and trying that out, like I was like, I need to make some stock art. And I went in and did the AI generation. So pretty, absolutely incredible, right? OK. So I thought about that, this idea of a process. And I'm like, OK, maybe it's this cycle that we're just going through day over day, quarter over quarter, year over year. But I realized that it's a little bit more than a process. And because it the value that you put into your career, it compounds over time. And the, the way your career can gain momentum is by looking for a, a really good flywheel, something that you can put some energy into at the beginning, which you're doing right now, getting an education, looking at internships, working with others on projects, and so forth. You're getting that flywheel going. And as you go throughout your career, every little bit of energy that you intentionally put in to that is going to create more career momentum. And so I thought, how might we think about this a little bit differently? And I thought, OK. You know, the first thing, going back to the opening of this talk, is really about learning. Again, this is not 
what's coming to you, it's what you're searching for. It is what you are doing for and, and to yourself to become the best version of you. And through that intense focus, you wind up picking up a skill or two. And we start to see this in some competencies. Yep, maybe it's a project you've entered onto and you felt maybe not ready for it, but now you've been with this team, you've had a piece of work, and you've delivered it, and your whole project is off to a great start, and so now you're feeling pretty well on top of things. And you realize that there's a bunch of other things that you're still not super competent at, and that you believe might be interesting or important to do. And so, again, it's this sort of recognition and taking stock, like just taking a moment to think about what are the skills? Like, what did I learn out of this process? Right, being a little introspective, and that's, that's where this comes into is curiosity. I think, for me, if there was one thing I would stress is practice curiosity. It, it can be learned. Um, definitely, I think, in my experience, I think some people, um, I, for whatever reason, nature and or nurture, have a little bit more curiosity than others, but this is something I encourage you, if you want to spend some time on something, spend it on curiosity, because I think it'll accrete value to almost everything else that you do. And it's in this, it's in this curiosity that we, we look deeper, right? We think about, what did I learn? What came easy during this last process? What came not so easily? Who did I learn from the best? What were the qualities of that person that I worked with, that I learned from, that I actually, that resonated with me, that enabled me to build skills or knowledge in this area more rapidly, right? What you're doing is you're, you're in effect, you are figuring out how you can be a better learner, right? Because the world, like they say, the only constant is change. And it is, it's changing rapidly out there. And adaptability is, is one of the most important things. Oh, conversion error. Just disregard the, the floating end there. Um, and so it's this adaptation. And so now what you're doing is you're, you're thinking about, OK, I have a little bit of a better idea of you know, how I'm learning, who I'm learning from, what are the qualities that made it made it interesting and, and, and resonate for me. And that immediately goes to um, thinking about, okay, what's, what's next? What other skills do I think I, I want to pick up? Why do I want to learn those skills? What are the experiences that I want to have that, that help me um, in, develop that knowledge, those skills? Um, and frankly, the relationships with the people that you work with so closely. And so it's this adaptation of, of what you have and, and frankly application, right, to this next project. That really, I think if I were to think about my career, it would be a series of, of projects where one just kind of looped in into the next and it's about how are you um, maintaining that momentum how are you investing what you've learned into the next cycle so you can create that virtuous cycle? And what's interesting is you go through this adaptation and it kind of cycles back to the learning because you're on that next project. And guess what? You've had this spurt of a career growth, right? You feel like you've accomplished something. Either you've had a success within an internship or maybe it was a project here at Michigan or Maybe you're in your first job. But somehow, some way, you know, you have started this, this growth. And with the growth, something interesting happens. We get a little more confidence, right? Because we've, <clears throat> we've been a little bit more in touch. We've done this introspection, and you've tested it. You know, you've used maybe not the scientific method on yourself, but you've spent enough time, right, thinking through and noticing where and how you show up, the skills, how they related to the project, what worked, what didn't, and so forth, that now you've got some confidence, and you're like, you know what, I can do that. 
right? I've got this. I can go do the next project, and I can be a member of this team, and I can go make this happen. And it, you show up in a whole different way. And guess what happens when you have a little bit of that? You get more opportunities. All of a sudden, magically, you're confronted with a lot more opportunities because you're taking stock of what you know, and more importantly, you know, what you know how to do and do really, really well, that, that zone of genius, and you show up with confidence to go execute that and knowing where else you want to learn, having the humility to know that no one knows everything, but together we can solve any problem. And so it's through those, those more opportunities, it goes back into the learning, and your whole career flywheel gains momentum, and you get this career growth. And frankly, I feel like I've experienced some of this, and I, um, I'm a big fan of flywheels, and so I you know, tried to put it in a, in a way that maybe each of you here could you know, tease apart a little bit and maybe focus on, on just one or two of these areas you know, to get started. So you know, I, I, I talked a little bit about um, this, this flywheel, and one of the things I mentioned was, you know, during the introspection piece, it was to really not just understand, like, how did you learn, what did you learn, what came easy or easily, but who, who did you learn well from? And that piece has been a center point of, of my career for about 30, about 30 years now. And so I put this together to kind of offer a little bit of a framework, and it's this idea of in, in, intentional relationships. And, um, and <laughs> it's interesting, I feel that from an entrepreneur perspective, I, I've worked with, I don't know, between 150 and 200 startup companies. And this is one of the patterns I've just seen across the board. And this goes for companies in Germany and some of my work I do with, with Siemens. It goes to the work I do here and in California with Alchemist and Cal Berkeley. Um, it's, this, it's the entrepreneurs that have this X factor on intentional relationships. And so, you know, there's this experiment. And I don't know if the format here is going to work, but, like, the idea is you pick somebody that, that knows you pretty well, and, and you ask them to describe you, right? They have to pick five adjectives. So you might want to do this maybe outside of, of this session. Um, I would try to not pick a close relative, maybe focus on someone you've done some project work with or a classmate, because the context matters. You know, you're, you're trying to do this from a, a career and job and entrepreneurial perspective. Otherwise, you know, one of your close relatives might just, you know, tell you how you're the apple of their eye, and unfortunately, it's really nice to hear that, but you won't get a lot out of it, right? Um, for what you're trying, the company you're trying to build. And so, you know, you, you, you get these relationships and then you start describing them each, right? So now, um, looking for these, these three adjectives. And what's interesting is that you'll start to see similarities, right? You'll start to see what this very, very simple survey of people that, again, know you in a particular context, right? The context of innovation, project work, and so forth. And, and you can really start to see a pattern emerge, right? Remember we talked about like being introspective about how you show up? This is one of those tools. Just ask. And it's interesting, this, this fellow Jim Rohn, he said, you know, you're the, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Think about that. I put some characters up here. Some of you may recognize these. I think many of you will not, but... Um, I will, uh, there will be a prize awarded for someone who can get all five without using Google Lens. Um, <laughs> okay, and so think about that, right? Like if you talk to these five people and you're like this average of these close work, colleague relationships, you know, what does that mean? What do you, what do you infer? Anybody, just raise your hand. What do you infer from that? It, let's just say, this is an idea, right? It's not a fact. It's an idea to sell books. But let's just say for a second that it was true. If you knew that was true, what would you do? 
Again, in the career context, anybody, what would be your next move? Uh, you again? No, different guy. Okay. <laughs> Find the five best people and spend all of your time with them. Is it five best? What's best? Okay, next. <laughs> okay, sorry. Good, good answer, but yes. Keep, okay, go ahead. Okay, five billionaires, yes. It's better to have a friend with a boat than own a boat, yes. Go ahead. To train your friends. Oh, I like that. Train your friends, yep. Diverse people. Oh, I like that one a lot. I think we want to talk about that one more. Go ahead. Five people you'd like to be more like. Hang on a second. I'm going to do something unconventional here that might end me in the hospital. Go ahead. Repeat what you just said. Oh, I was saying that you find five people that you admire who you like. And the more time that you spend with them, you start to adapt their habits and you become more similar to them in terms of what you admired before about them. So you would also like have those adjectives described about you eventually. Interesting. I like that. That's super interesting. Yep. Do you want the mic too, or do you have something valuable to add? Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> What's the question? What if you don't see anything wrong with yourself? That's what I figured the question was going to be. <laughs> this is uh, Michigan at its best. <laughs> For anybody that didn't hear that, that is, what if you don't find anything wrong with yourself? Okay. <laughs> and um, the answer is right up here. Who knows who John Doerr is? Somebody, please tell me who John Doerr is. Come on, you're an entrepreneur class. You're an e-hour. Okay, go ahead. Something like that, yes, a tech guy. At Intel. Okay, oops, clock. Okay, somebody else want to Google it fast and save this gentleman? Ideas are easy. We're all afraid about sharing idea with a company or a competitor because they might go do something with it. That assumes your idea is any good. Ideas are easy, execution is everything, and it takes a team to win. And so you want to always be building a winning team around you, OK? By the way, just to pause, you probably hear a lot from people up here on the stage, and they have a lot of advice. And one thing I've learned is that it, advice is forged in the crucible of the individual's experiences. It is literally a culmination of all of their greatest aspirations and worst fears and some of the actual experiences that actually touch them. And so I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm giving you some advice, but what's important is to know the lens through which the advice is given because it may not apply to you at all. And so I would encourage you to use the curiosity we talked about to not only use it to work on yourself, but when you ask for advice, know the background of the person giving you the advice so you understand the context in which they're giving it to you, right? A very simple question. You can just say, hmm, that's interesting. What experiences did you have that you know, forge this philosophy that you have now, right? Just a way to kind of get context. So I just wanted to let you know, everything I'm saying here is just advice. You can take it or leave it. Um, but it is my experience. And so there's this idea of a board of you, and it's not just a bunch of mentors, right? We look for mentors. We have mentorship programs and so forth. But it's not just about mentors. Uh, it's about intentional relationships, okay? And so what are, what are intentional relationships, right? It's about filtering who you invite to your board. Imagine, you know, you're all here at e-hour, entrepreneurship hour. You're going to have a board of someday. Why don't make it today and make it a board of you? Make it a board of advisors for you and your career. And so there's this idea, going to have to work on the PPTX to Google Slides conversion that is, uh, that's, a, that's a real issue. Okay, so I, I, I think about intentional relationships this way. I think it's these, these three things. Um, first, it is about um, this shared experience, um, going through something with another or a group, 
makes all the difference. It creates trust um, that then allows you to do things that you thought were impossible. This active relationship, you know, um, not calling someone five years later to ask them for a favor, but actually investing in the relationship and meaningful roles. And so, what, 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 you know, what do, I, what do I think about this um, in terms of how do you start going about a board of you? Well, there's this idea of that just, just take any project you're working on, right? Anything you might be collaborating with a group of others, it could be something, classwork, it could be an internship. You could even invent something. It really doesn't matter as long as you just commit those cognitive resources to, to the exercise. And um, what you can do is think now, let me think about three key people and just do a chemistry test, right? I call it a chemistry test. And then you want to look at your pre-work and then do this coaching test. So let's, let's take a quick look. So the coaching roles, right? So I think about this board of you, right? A board of advisors who's just trying to coach you. Coaches, they see what's in your blind spot. They first, actually, they help you set a goal. That's your goal, not their goal. Then they help you build skills and with, through challenges. Coaches help you by looking at what's in your blind spot to let you know about things that you don't know and you don't know you don't know them. And coaches celebrate with you. That's a coach. So that's, those are a few of the qualities you want in someone that you're going to try to bring in. And so when you're thinking about the different coaching roles, you might be thinking about how you might prioritize these board members. Okay, so we list the two to three people you're thinking about. You think about the different opportunities that you're looking for, where you think you want to learn. Remember on our flywheel, we talked about, we go through the learning, we have a little, some competency, and then we do the curiosity and we start to realize, what are we building in and where do we want to grow? And this might be that opportunity to start thinking about what are the relationships I want to create? Who are the people I want to work with that I can model, right? Who are the people I respect and admire? I've done this multiple times. I think my entire career has been made up of just finding something I'm curious about, finding people who are awesome at that role, like objectively awesome at that job and the qualities they have that I know I can work with, and then finding a business opportunity, a priority for the business, and launching a new project. I've, basically, 80% of the roles I've held have been ones I've invented through doing that, that whole thing. And then you start matching people. So think about those folks that might be the people you admire. What are their skills? How do they apply to the things you want to focus on? And then start matching them out. And here's an example, really, really simple. Let's say you've got this project and you're going to need these three skills. You want to know a little bit more about communications, team building, and some strategy. And you start looking across the people that you know. And you're like, you know, Leslie, I really admire her for her negotiation and leadership, Aaron for team building and marketing, and Joanne for communications and uh, communication strategy. And what you start to realize is maybe, maybe there's some overlap, right, in, in terms of who, who these people are and what they're really good at, what you admire, what you can learn from them, and you can start selecting folks to your, to your board. You know, part of intentional means you're being upfront about the relationships you're trying to build. And so make it clear when you're inviting somebody to, to do this process with you, right? Um, so, you know, there's this idea of goals and roles. And I think my, um, the formula that has worked for me, and it, it's because of my personality and character and everything else, has been, has been these three things, right? Being a little bit vulnerable, I know it can be anxiety-inducing sometimes, but sharing a little bit of vulnerability creates an opening for another person to be vulnerable to. And by being just a little bit vulnerable, you're putting trust in this other person, and it invites them to put a little bit of trust in you. And that is the absolute essence of, of a relationship, is that trust. And so the vulnerability and then being authentic about it and humble um, is a very, very powerful cocktail for success here. 
yeah, we go into this nurturing piece, and it's just about another cycle. I'm big on cycles. I don't think anything's ever, the things that are worth doing are things you should just create habits around and just, and just do, you know, and this is one of them. Um, there's a cycle of creating and nurturing and evaluating, going through the shared experience, and guess what? Does, this, does any company's board stay the same over any grand length of period? No, right? There's change, and there's internal and external factors that affect that change, and the same goes for you. So this reevaluation, back to introspection and curiosity, super, super important. And so I guess this is it, right? Build intentional relationships. Think about this thing, that you're the average of the five closest colleagues that you work with, how can you be more intentional about, intentional about selecting those? Um, focus on interests. You know, motive, to me, motivation is the product of a person's interest and their perceived ability to get something done. I want to be the first man on Mars. I have a very high interest in that. My perceived ability for that to be true is zero. Therefore, my motivation to go to Mars is zero. It's not going to happen, right? But look for things where you have an inclination, right, and um, the, the perceived ability to achieve something. And that will create an enormous amount of intrinsic motivation for you to push through the adversity you will face. And of course, actively nurturing, I mean, these things, if you, I use the word nurture intentionally because you get out what you put in. If you don't be part of the relationship, it will suffer and it'll wither and it will go away. Um, and then with this, I'm telling you, and I'm, I'm a walking example of it, I have still friends with people I met on the first day of my first job of my, of my entire career. And all the way through 30 years. Um, and it winds up being very rewarding. All right, and that's it, same idea. Next three days, take something that you thought was interesting and just work on it a little bit. And if you want to make it something that you'll actually work on, share it with a colleague and help have them hold you to it. All right, thank you, yep. <laughs> Any questions? You guys have seen all this all before. Very. Um, I think it was, I think in this flywheel thing, I think for me early in my career, it was, um, it was a confidence thing. You know, it was, it was after going through the cycle and I just didn't recognize that I could pop out and get that extra arc of, of energy into the, into the confidence and more opportunities piece. And um, the way that showed up was, I would say early in my career, a lot of lateral moves, right? Just trying to like go to the next thing, maybe avoiding a bigger challenge that I maybe didn't think I could do. Um, I've learned differently though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Specifically at like solar car. Sorry. How do you foster those relations in that cycle when you were like doing stuff at Michigan like solar car? You know, I um, I don't I didn't know this back then, so that's a very unfair question. <laughs> uh, I think it's more of like, you know, because what, what was I like 19, you know, 20, 20 years old. I think when I think back. I just tried to be a really good friend and worker. Um, okay, so something I think that did contribute to this is, so my dad was an electrician, my mom was a school teacher. I was 13 years old. My summer was spent on a job site digging ditches, removing light fixtures for demolition on a building. I worked every summer, every spring break between age 13 and till I, at now. <laughs> so, um, I think it was a little bit of that work ethic. You know, when you're in, if you're in a trade like that, you, the work is only happening when you are at work. And I, I think I just, that was imprinted on me. And so when I'm there, I'm at work and I'm getting it done because I, 
you know, went through the ass kicking of working a construction job, <laughs> so I knew what it was like. Yep. Does that help? Yeah. Uh, okay, let's unpack that one. How much time do we have left? Okay, a couple minutes. Okay, so the question, the question is how, because my background is in this product go-to-market area. Is that, that's it? Okay, so um, let me maybe explain a little bit of what that means, and then, okay. So, over, I would say over the last 10, 12 years or so, um, I developed an insight that is, is now, it's a little more common now, and it really, this all came together when I was working on acquisitions at VMware. I worked on about 14 different acquisitions at the company. So when I joined VMware, it was at 200 people, and when I left, it was 15 or 16,000, now it's 35,000. I always tell people I worked there during the, quote, good years, right? Like, it's a little bit, they kind of had their lunch ate uh, by, by Amazon, but we enjoyed a lot of success early on. And, Working on these, these acquisitions meant I had to look at the company we were buying, the products they had, how they were selling and delivering the value of those products, and how that process or model actually worked with our own model of going to market. And it was through that experience of just working on one startup, or excuse me, one acquisition after another, that I started to build a framework. I, I am a, <laughs> I'm an engineer through and through. I started as Arrow here, and then there was not gonna be any jobs, my uncle told me, who worked at Grumman. And so I switched over to industrial engineering. But I'm a framework person, and my early work at Accenture taught me, if I'm gonna do something once, I'm probably gonna do it a thousand times. So as soon as I see something, I start thinking about how to automate it. And so that's what I did. And I, I wrote a playbook at VMware on how to integrate uh, new companies into the, into the business. And what that taught me, um, which is what I, uh, the class I taught yesterday, is that there is this, this inextricable connection between the product you're building and the way in which you're going to distribute it, your go-to-market, how you will reach, how will you, you will deliver the benefits of the product you're building to the customer and how the customer will realize those benefits and pay you, and be a reference, and buy more, and buy different products from you, and so forth. And it, again, through my career, I've seen companies that are world-class experts at getting this connection right. They are baking in the go-to-market into the product they're designing. They figured out who they're gonna sell to, how they're gonna sell, how the customer buys, through what channels they buy, how much they're willing to spend, all of it before they've written a line of code. And those companies that do that, that figure it out first, they then build a product that matches the market. And it does what I call, it matches the, the go-to-market. And so I think one of the, you know, one of the telltale signs, or one of the easiest questions is just to say something to the effect of, hey, tell me, if you're interviewing, it's just like, tell me about your, you know, your product strategy and the way that interacts or influences your go-to-market. It's almost like a trick question, right? Because I think the best answer is they say, well, they don't, they influence each other, right? We think about our go-to-market, it influences our product. We think about our product, it influences our go-to-market, and we iterate on that and we get alignment. And I think that's a really good answer. But if they say, we get our product strategy, we publish it, <laughs> We have a bunch of people look at it, and then the marketing team gets it. Eh, you know, that I, I think that if they're trying to enter a new market, new customer, same market, new product, I think it's, it's going to be very difficult for them because the, the conditions in the, in the world, are, they don't suffer uh, not well-defined go-to-market these days. Yeah. Yeah. Student? Yeah. <laughs> no.
VMware's lunch being eaten by Amazon. So I was wondering, yeah, could you explain about how that happened, why it happened, what you didn't realize then that you would or you do now? I remember the day I, I was sitting at seven, um, 71 Stevenson in San Francisco and I was reading a news article about Amazon and I was like, these folks are going to be an issue for us. And um, I mean, back then, I mean, this had to be 2008 or nine, right? I mean, a, a while ago. And it's classic innovator's dilemma. Any raise hands, you guys know innovator's dilemma? No? Okay. Eric, I thought this was an entrepreneur class. Okay. Just, I'm just kidding. Just giving you guys a hard time. Okay, so innovator's dilemma, the, the, the high level is you get to a certain point and you've got a base of customers that take up so much of your attention to serve, you miss the opportunity to serve the new customer and the new market that's really important. This happens all the time. And there's a few ways to get around it. It's difficult no matter what you do. I think the best way to do it is to leave and create a startup <laughs> to go solve that problem. And companies do that. They spin off a group, but it's still part of the company. What happened to VMware is we were printing money. I mean, like the company was making, we grew so quickly. Um, and when you're making that much money and you're servicing all those customers and you're building an entire set of muscle mass and, and brain power and, and DNA around solving an existing problem, when a completely novel problem comes around, you do not have the, the capabilities in-house to deal with it. We were focused on going to Morgan Stanley and saying, we'd like to convert your 100,000 servers into a thousand servers and we're gonna just put it, we're gonna help you reduce your footprint in your data center. Well, no one does that anymore. They just go to Google, Amazon, or Microsoft and they just put it in the cloud. But VMware was utterly focused on just you know, executing, executing that, that, that existing go-to-market. And, and, and you know, they had very frail efforts at thinking about cloud. And the rest is history. You know, now that's going to be part of Broadcom. Yep, one more question, I think. Um, yeah, here. Yep. Um, I have a question about building the intentional relationship. Yep. Um, do you have any suggestion on the practical way to uh, build a relationship, for instance, to be uh, like more personal, inviting them to dinner or something like that? Yeah. No, thanks. So the question was like advice on building an intentional relationship? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I would say, number one, put the Tinder app down. That would be number one. Don't use that for work. Um, I'm just, again, I'm just kidding. This is a tough crowd. This is really, jeez, goodness. Okay. Yeah, I think, again, I, I go immediately back to vulnerability. I, I will tell you, um, asking for help is one of the most powerful, magical devices you have at your disposal. Just going up to somebody and saying, hey, I noticed the way you answered, I'm making this up, right? Okay, I noticed the way you answered this question in class and it got me thinking, I really like the way, I really like the way your brain works and I have a problem and I was wondering if you could help me think about it. Boom. Oh, sure, what do you, what do you have in mind? You know, would you mind meeting for a coffee or whatever? Like, it's just, a lot of times, it's just the very, very beginning of it and, and I think when you start the relationship in an authentic, humble, genuine way, that's the trust, and you can build from there. If it's manufactured, if it's not genuine, and you're just doing it to collect board members, right? If you're, if you're checking the box that I got five members, humans are really good detecting this, and they'll, they'll say, yeah, I don't think so, right? So just start with humility, then go to, think about you know, an authentic, genuine reason, and then find somebody that you think you might learn something from and just ask them for help. And just start there. All right. Yep. All right. <laughs> thank you, thank you.